we have a focus on high-end client service and high-end technical advice. Um, we, we put a lot of store into the uh, employees that we bring on board and, and feel that, that reflects on our, our value to the industry. Um, we are known in the industry for advancing the science and really bringing cutting-edge science and engineering to uh, environmental assessment and remediation. Uh, this allows us to tackle jobs that some others uh, where, where others fear to tread in some cases and also to be pioneers um, in, in the commercialization and the bringing to market of certain technologies that have now become commonplace in the market. We are a family of companies, uh, Geosyntec Consultants along with Serum, which provide advanced uh, remediation technology assessment, uh, sort of bench scale trials, uh, molecular analytical techniques, uh, MMI, who are involved um, with safety engineering, risk management services, and our most recent uh, addition, Savron, which licenses a smoldering combustion technology, which is a new technology we're bringing to market uh, for, to address difficult uh, Dean Apple type um, situations. We are technology developers. We feel this is one of the areas that uh, provides us differentiation from the rest of the pack, if you will. Um, we do invest a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort into uh, collaborative research and development of new remedial technologies for the environmental field. Uh, we do this in collaboration with uh, government, funding, government funding sources, uh, universities, and have used uh, this, this sort of arrangement to really push the science and advance the engineering on a number of remediation techniques uh, that has either resulted in introduction of new techniques completely or the advancement of existing techniques to a broader application. So our presenter today is Jamie Rosen, who is an associate geologist with Geosyntec based in our Guelph office close to Toronto in Canada. He has a background mm -hmm. in geology and hydrogeology and is currently our data management practice leader. I uh, saw a very good presentation by Jamie recently when I was in the Guelph office on a data management uh, tools and techniques that he's developed. You can see a number of those listed at the bottom of the screen. Um, very honored to have him here today and appreciative of uh, Jamie giving us his time at this sort of awkward um, hour. Uh, unfortunately, the time no, differences no problem. here and there are <laughs> very difficult, but uh, he's, Happy to he's kindly joined us. And uh, Jamie, I will hand over to you for the presentation. Thank you very much. I've spent a lot of time over the years managing environmental data in a legal context for uh, toxic torts, as, as they're called in the U.S. and, and possibly elsewhere as well, and uh, helping attorneys and other legal professionals understand what it actually means to have a whole pile of environmental data, groundwater contaminant samples, soil samples, etc., and most importantly, what you as uh, legal professionals need to know to understand if your data is being managed correctly, if your opponent's data is being managed incorrectly, if you're in a, in a opposing uh, environment, and um, how to get the most out of your experts and your consultants if you're uh, retaining experts to look at and manage and analyze environmental data. So you may not think data is the most exciting uh, topic, but, but it is my life, and I'm glad I'm exciting. And one of the things that excites me is recognizing that environmental data travels through what I like to think of as a whole life cycle, as many stages before it can be actually used. And it's important to recognize and understand each of these life cycle stages and what they mean to you and where the potential traps and pitfalls are that might cause you trouble in your sites and in your, uh, your enterprises later on. So by way of an introduction, data begins when a sample is collected. That's not actually true. There's all sorts of uh, pre-collection planning and uh, data quality objectives, et cetera. But for our purposes here, we're going to start by collecting some bit of stuff from the ground or from the water or from the air, from the soil. This is sample collection. We don't really have data yet. We have uh, data about the sample. 
but it will still be part of the life cycle. And then we're going to analyze that data. We're going to send it to a lab or put it through some sort of machine and turn that sample into what we traditionally think of as data, so concentrations of chemicals in groundwater, that sort of thing. Then we're going to determine if we can even use this data, if it makes sense, if it's valid through twin processes. And uh, you may be familiar with these, you may not. I'll explain them uh, in a few moments. But these are the processes of data validation and database verification. And these happen simultaneously, or at least in, in different parts of, uh, of the expert's world. And only then can we compile all this data and stick it into some sort of a database or a spreadsheet or however we're choosing to store our data. And only then can we actually analyze the data. So we're at step five here. This is where we're turning data into information, into something that's usable. And of course, it's all for naught if we can't put it into some sort of a report or stick it on a website or something. So our last stage in the life cycle is data presentation, where we actually explain and tell a story as to what the data means. And kind of off here, I hope you can see my cursor, but off here, uh, outside of the life cycle, but the thing that has its place is this world of conceptual graphics. So these are artist renderings and drawings and animations that are not truly based on data, so they don't get to be part of the life cycle in, in my book, but they are part of the uh, environmental um, storytelling that uh, legal professionals, lawyers, attorneys need to be aware of. So I, I kind of relegated off to the, to the side here. All right, so I'll take you through each of these life cycle stages uh, in brief and, and share with you a few details that uh, have helped me in speaking with, uh, with lawyers over the years. So let's start with sample collection. This is uh, purposely simple and, and probably patronizingly simple, but um, I'm sure you've, you've experienced this kind of thing. But for our purposes, we're just talking about a bottle of stuff when we collect a sample. This is um, some container that has a sample of environmental medium. It might be a a container of groundwater, it might be a beaker of soil, it might be a, an aliquot of air or something, but as far as the data is concerned, we're handling it all the same way. It's a bottle of stuff. And this is when we assign that bottle a sample ID. And this is absolutely imperative. The sample ID is going to follow us through the entire life cycle, and it's ultimately what is going to let us transparently and defensively take data and trace it all the way back to when it was just a little bottle of stuff and thus really tell our story in the context of where the data actually came from. We're going to record lots of metadata at this stage, uh, so data about the sample, probably in a, in a little black sample log where we'll write down how we took the sample, the date and time, who took it, etc. And we'll almost certainly fill out a chain of custody. And uh, I obviously can't see you nodding along, but I, I assume you're, you're nodding vigorously here because you're, you've seen chains of custody, you're familiar with those. But this is a, a legal document that is our, our fingerprint, our way of tracing that bottle right back to the well or the sample or the, the position of the surface water from which it was taken. So here's a chain of custody. This is a, an old one, it's very simple but it has all the components that, uh, that need to be there. Here we have that fingerprint. This is a sample ID. Every bottle gets its own identifier. And we have the date and time it was taken. We have several signatures here that show how the chain has followed these samples through, uh, through delivery to a laboratory or to a geotechnical center or something. And here we've told the lab which analyte we want to analyze here. If we don't have some version of this piece of paper, be it the actual piece of paper or a photo of it or a digital version of it, then we're lost. We won't be able to say that if we have a, a graph that shows some contamination, where that contamination came from. We need the chain of custody. We need the sample ID all through the life cycle. All right. At each of these life cycle stages, I thought it would be helpful to share with you some questions that you may have in your back pocket to ask your expert or to ask uh, yourselves if, if you're doing this sort of work to ask your opponents if you're in a, um, a, a court situation just to confirm that each of these life cycle stages were actually performed correctly and to identify any errors that might have come. So at sample collection, we'll certainly ask about the chain of custody. Was it filled out properly? Was it filled out at all? Was it signed? You know, did the laboratory actually take custody of this sample and, and is our concentration actually associated with their right sample? Do we know who took that sample? Do we know if they are trained in the sampling methodology? 
did they write down the date and time and, and the weather conditions and the field conditions? Is there anything that might affect whether and to what extent we can use this data later on? All questions you can ask at sample collection. All right, we'll get more exciting as we go. So sample analysis. Now we take our bottle of stuff and we subject it to some sort of analysis to add data to the process. And, and usually this is an analytical laboratory, although it might just be a thermometer that we stick in the bottle and, and write down data. It's a, anything that is going to make some quantitative or even qualitative observation of what's in that bottle. And uh, I, I'm, I've spent some time in the lab, but I, I didn't enjoy it very much, so I just think of a laboratory as, as a big black box, and the bottle of stuff goes in and data comes out. And that's, uh, from the data life cycle point of view, that, that might be sufficient. Now, the laboratory, or the machine, if you like, are going to produce two documents that are of, uh, of importance to turning this bottle of stuff into data. The first one you might have seen before, this is a laboratory analytical report. This is a very simple one again, but uh, um, it has the information we're looking for. A lab report is designed for humans to read, as opposed to computers, which we'll come to. And it has to start with that all-important sample ID. We'll keep coming back to that. And here it lists the constituents or chemicals or compounds or analytes or whatever, uh, whatever name you like. It's going to give us our results, our concentrations. Here's some qualifiers. Uh, I'm trusting that you're seeing the mouse, by the way, uh, Lang. Please let me know if that's not the case. Here we have our the units for the concentration. And here we have one of many limits. Perhaps you, you've seen these before. Detection limit, reporting limit, method limit. In this case, it's a PQL, a practical quantitation limit. And this will be important for how we qualify the data later on. In addition to the lab report, now we enter my world, the laboratory also produces the same information in a format designed for a computer to read. These are not user-friendly. They're not the kind of thing that you would print out and, and read through, but they're very important to the life cycle of environmental data. This is an EDD, an electronic data deliverable. Think of this as an Excel document, if you're familiar with spreadsheets. Uh, it generally doesn't come in that format, but it might as well. We have columns with lots of repetition, of computers like that. But it's all the same information. Here's that sample ID the matrix from which the bottle of stuff came, date, analytical method, here are the chemicals, and here's our concentration of results. And uh, I'll point something out to you. If you're familiar with Excel, you might recognize there's a little green symbol on the upper left-hand corner, and that's telling us that even though this looks like a number, it's actually text. This is very important. This is what we want. We want text as opposed to what the computer recognizes as a number here, because we want to understand the precision that the laboratory intended to give us. So that's the number of zeros. Excel is going to do you a favor and turn 1.10 into 1.1. But 1.10 has a very different meaning than 1.1. It has an extra decimal precision, and, and this is extremely important for analysis and, and defensibility, et cetera. So these EDDs generally come as text files, which is how we want them. That way we know that Excel or another application isn't fiddling with our precision. Qualifier, this is a, a letter code, uh, sometimes numeric, that accompanies a result that tells us what the lab wants us to know about that result. In this case, it's J qualify, which refers to an estimate. And you can see that this number falls between the method detection limit and the reporting limit, which is why the lab has qualified it. They think it's 1.7, but it's really an estimate. It might be a little lower, it might be a little higher. The EDD is how we like to receive analytical data from the data management point of view. You could spend weeks learning about sample analysis and, and uh, learning what questions to ask, but from the data management point of view, I would like project managers and, and our clients to be aware of this sort of thing. I want to know if the lab report, report was prepared by a qualified person, meaning did, uh, did the intern prepare the lab report in a way that, uh, that wasn't correct or wasn't consistent with the laboratory's uh, quality control procedures, et cetera, especially the EDD. To this day, I, I find that some laboratories generate their EDDs manually as opposed to using the software that comes with their laboratory equipment. And this is a problem because if you do something manually, then you might introduce some transcription error or some human error. So we want to know that the EDD was uh, generated the proper way. Talked a bit about this already, but did the lab report and the EDD 
honor the precision? Has there been any rounding or any truncation of trailing zeros? And this is really significant. If, if we have a regulatory standard of five concentration units and we are given a concentration of 4.7 uh, of our contaminant, then we can rest easy that our, our contaminant is not at a concentration higher than standard. But if this 4.7 is rounded up to 5 and this 5.0 is rounded to 5, suddenly our concentration is at the regulatory limit, not below, which, of course, you'll, you'll agree is, is a very, very different story. Now we have a regulatory problem, not, uh, not a clean sample. And finally, we'll keep coming back to this, can we trace data through a chain of custody right back to that old bottle of stuff? Can we confirm that our concentration that may or may not exceed a regulatory standard actually came from where we think it is? All right, we've uh, collected a bottle of stuff from the ground. We've turned it into data through sample analysis. Now we have to determine if those data are usable. We do that through these two twin processes. First is data validation, and uh, you may be well familiar with data validation. If you're like me, you may be scared of data validation because it, it can be a very uh, time-consuming, expensive process, um, but a very important one. So through data validation, we have a chemist usually go through the laboratory reports uh, in, in great detail and determine if the laboratory did anything that, uh, that we prefer they didn't. If the laboratory detected a, a contaminant in their sample, not the contaminant we asked them to, but a laboratory contaminant, then we may need a, the data validator to identify and qualify that. And although everything the data validators do is important, there's uh, three things that, that I believe are the most significant. This is what, uh, what lawyers need to know about. Data validation may reject a value outright. They may say that uh, the laboratory screwed up, they have contamination, they have a problem. This particular concentration we just simply cannot use. It is rejected. It can never be reported. They may change a non-detect sample to a detection, or vice versa, but that's much, much less common, by reviewing the limits. So whereas you might report less than four, the validators might say, no, you've got four with no qualifier, four parts per billion, if you like. Or they may alter a concentration. They may say, instead of using this number, we need to use this other number uh, because of how the reporting limits work or the method detection limits, that kind of thing. What the data validators do are actually ask a lot of questions of the data. They look at sample collection. They look at holding time. They look at the chain of custody, just like we've been talking about. They look at um, uh, spike concentrations and surrogates and internal standards and all these quality control procedures that, uh, that a good lab should have, and they make sure that the data really are what the lab says it is and really are usable. In the meantime, we also have a process of database verification. This is it doesn't get as much press as data validation, but it's certainly important. So much like the validators review the lab report, in database verification, our database tools review the EDD. And we're really looking for two things here. We're looking for completeness, i.e., does the EDD contain units? Does it contain locations? Does it have everything we need it to? And compliance with valid values. And that's just a fancy way of saying, is everything on the EDD a recognizable term? If there's a, a chemical, do we recognize that chemical name, or is it misspelled, or is it a synonym of a chemical, or is it a, a new chemical that we're not familiar with? All our units recognizable? Are our locations correct? Do they say monitoring well one instead of MW1 or MW01 or MW-01, or all the different ways there are of writing down monitoring well one? We want these to be uh, valid. We want them to comply with our valid value list. <clears throat> so we ask questions of the data, just like the validators do. Do our sample IDs have locations? Do we know which concentrations are detected and which are non-detect? Do we already have these data? This happens a lot. Uh, maybe we had the data from a preliminary EDD, and now we have it again. So are we going to replace our old data? Do we qualify our old data and replace it with this one? This is all database verification. Not the most exciting, I know. The questions I'd ask my experts, on this stage, what level of data validation was performed? Uh, it's not enough to say that we performed data validation. We need to know if we did it on all the data or just 10% of the data or half the data. And did we look at everything we possibly could or did we just do a cursory check? So level one validation, level four validation, these are uh, US terms for 
um, validation uh, methodologies. Who perform the validation? Do they are they qualified? Do they know what they're validating? Are they organic chemists? And are they being asked to validate metals data? In which case is that appropriate? And on database verification, was it even performed? Did someone just take the EDD and add it to the database? In which case we might have all sorts of duplication or or were these processes performed correctly? All right, getting a little more exciting now on to who is the database. We've taken our bottle of stuff, we've turned it into data, we've determined we can use the data. Now we need to look at it in the context of all the other site data, and we do that through our data assembly. That might just be as simple as opening a spreadsheet, or it might be much more complex and involved, uh, adding it to some enterprise database that's web accessible, that kind of thing. And a big part about assembling data is dealing with geography, dealing with spatial data. In the environmental world, every bottle of stuff we have have come from a location, but we need to know where that location is in the context of all these other things. So we have a specialized technology for dealing with spatial data in a database, and that's GIS, Geographical Information System. Perhaps you've heard of it. If not, if you've used Google Maps or some similar technology, then, then this is the technology you're using, GIS. So a typical project might have several GIS layers or GIS data collections. We might start with a simple base map that shows roads and surface features. Here we'll add on a topographical map. Here we might overlay an aerial photo, we usually these are in color these days, of course. Here we might add our sample locations and we'll color code them by uh, soil, groundwater, or vapor. Here we have satellite imagery that we'll use for remote sensing and so on and so on. This is a, a superficial soil geology, and we can go on and on. Ask our experts lots of questions here, and especially if, uh, if you're in a uh, tort situation or, or a criminal case or that kind of thing, then this is a great place to catch errors in your opponent's work. Is there any manual data transcription? If we stuck something in a database, did anybody type it? And if so, who checked it? Did we know it was typed correctly? Uh, was it imported using a proper procedure, or was it transcribed? We have these valid value lists. And this is a good one, spatial data. It would make any assumptions. If, uh, if you just simply download a map for the internet, it may be valid at a certain geographical scale that just isn't appropriate for our site. If you zoom in on your street, are they the right width, or are they just a line that, you, that is now a thick line because you've zoomed in on? Is it not uh, spatially accurate? Are we using a city-wide map to represent something on a very small site scale, this kind of thing. They're all questions that your expert needs to be aware of in data assembly. All right, now comes the fun part. We've got our data in a database. We can look at it in the context of all the other site data and tell a complete story of our site. Now we get into data analysis. Again, you could spend uh, weeks or, or, or a career, I guess for that matter, learning about all the ways of analyzing data. But I'll summarize it by discussing this concept of, of a continuum of judgment. And um, as legal professionals, I'm sure you'll know that um, the more complicated the analysis, the more we have to defend and determine that the person doing the analysis has the appropriate degree and, and the appropriate judgment. And my advice is to always start with an analysis that requires very little judgment, like just simply sorting your data or, or doing very basic statistics rather than having to defend your degree and your um, ability to analyze data, et cetera. Uh, but it may be that a very strong uh, experiential judgment, someone who's been doing this their whole life, may need to get involved to really tell a story of your site if it's that complicated. But uh, if nothing else, you should take away that if you're making some one of these analyses or if your expert is, they should at least understand what degree of judgment is imposed. A lot of people think they can open software and, and press analyze and they're not making any judgment calls, but of course they are. You're agreeing that the computer is making appropriate assumptions and using the, the right statistics and all that. So you, you can't do anything without uh, recognizing that there's some judgment. So like I say, start simple. You can tell a lot about data just by sorting it or filtering it. There's still judgment involved there. It's not, it's not totally without judgment, but, but it's pretty easy to defend. So we might look at all of our concentrations of a, of a contaminant like TCE and sort them and compare them to a standard and make some comment about uh, whether we have um, exceedances or not. We may look at detection frequencies, which is just the, um, the number of sample 
samples that have a, a analyte detected as a function of the, the total number of samples. Getting a little more advanced, we might do statistics. Statistics deals a lot with sameness of data and measures of ten central tendency. So if we've got 50 concentrations, what's the best single number to represent all of them? Is it an average, a geometric mean, a maximum, that kind of thing. I get a lot of questions about contouring and interpolation from my, my lawyer clients. And this is another type of statistics, another type of, uh, of judgment requiring analysis. So interpolation or contouring, if we know the concentration of a contaminant on one side of my house and on the other side of my house, what do we know about the concentration under my house? And we do that as often by contouring. So I, I realize you can't see this, but as an example of, of where contouring can get very difficult, something like this. This is a, an air photo that has little numbers representing groundwater elevation. And my task here was to contour the data to determine the direction of groundwater flow. And there's a lot going on here that the data doesn't quite reveal until you dig into the site conceptual model and everything we know about this site. And the contours that we actually drew here have some curvature and some other features, like this dry area here by the zero in 1580, that you wouldn't know just by contouring the data. So the message is to, uh, to don't contour it lightly. Don't just take the defaults of the software, but rather um, get an appropriate geologist or someone with the expertise to interpolate your data. And we often talk about the best way to show concentrations, to show contours on a map. And uh, I thought it would be helpful to show different examples of drawing contours for the same data set. Uh, this one is a problem for me, the one on the left, because the colors are so detailed and so fine that you can actually compare a, a very specific yellow to the legend and say, well, clearly here, the person doing the contouring meant to suggest that the concentration here was, you know, four significant digits, something really precise. Same thing on the right. We've got so many lines here that we're implying we have way more data than we probably actually do. I generally like something like the middle. Um, this is just simple color bands. All we're saying here is that if you're located somewhere in the yellow band, your concentration is somewhere between 10 and 100 parts per million, or your, your uh, air speed is somewhere between X and Y, that kind of thing. So contour in a way that doesn't suggest more confidence in your data than you have. Going a little further into the judgment, we can do predictive simulations. We may know what used to be happening on the site. We may know what's happening now, but do we know what's going to happen in the future? Or if we act on the system in a certain way, if we start pumping or if we build something, how is the system going to change? This is, requires a lot of judgment, these predictive simulations. And we often demonstrate our predictive simulations through animations, especially in a courtroom situation. So what we're doing here is showing the results of an analysis that was particularly important to the site. The question was, how long is it going to take until contamination from a particular industrial facility is going to reach the drinking water well. And, you know, you can agree this is a very important question. Um, is the water going to reach the well in two years, in which case we're in big trouble? Is it going to reach the water in, in 10 years or 50 years or 1,000 years, in which case we have time to put in a remediation activity? This takes a while to get going. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. I'm trusting that you've seen this kind of animation before, but if not, Stick around, I'm happy to show you in detail. But here's the important part. Uh, this is probably a little jumpy on the web sharing, but we've got little blue lines being drawn here in plan view and in the blue view that show the, our, our best expert estimate of, of the particle tracking. And here we've shown that it takes about 21 years, in this case, for the contamination from the facility to reach the well that's just at this particular river. But a lot of judgment here. Of course, we, we don't know what's going to happen in 21 years, so we have to defend our, our opinion with all the appropriate qualifiers. What kind of questions you'd want to ask your experts in data analysis? So I keep coming back to this. What level of judgment was imposed? Do you even know how much judgment you imposed? Or are you implying something you don't mean to? And was that level appropriate? This is a really big one. It's so easy to use software to make cool animations and, and contour maps and uh, graphs and charts and that kind of thing. But what is your software assuming on your behalf? If the software gives you an, uh, an average, is, uh, does average even make sense? Or is your data 
statistically distributed in a way that a, a simple average is just meaningless or, or is going to under or overestimate your, your true middle point. If you use a complete data set, if you gave me an average, is that the average of all the data or is it just the average of the shallow data or just the average of the air quality data that's from the north part of the facility? Or if we used all the data, should we have only used the north part of the facility because the south part of the facility has uh, a wall that, that stops the wind or, or something like that? Hopefully you get this idea. All right. We've taken a bottle of stuff. We've turned it into data. We've determined that the data is usable. We've assembled the data in a database, and we run analyses so that we have a story to tell. We think we understand what the data is saying. How do we communicate that story? We do that through data presentation. This is the charts and maps and tables and, and visualizations and drawings. And I've got a quote here from a, a famous geographer who I really admire. He says, there's no such thing as an objective map, and that, that is so true. Even the simplest map may have some emotive component to it, and we really need to understand what story our map is telling or what story it's telling that we don't want it to tell. And uh, I realize you've seen charts and maps before, so I won't, um, I won't define those, but I'll show you examples of how different maps can be used to tell different stories. Just like we only want to use simple data sorting rather than complicated statistics, it's nice to let the data tell its own story on a map. So if you don't, if you can just let the true measurement speak for themselves, rather than showing contours and judgments, perhaps you can do so. So this is a simple map where we're showing these are triangles that are color coded by the concentration of uh, groundwater that was found in them as a function of the regulatory standard. So green is below the, the standard, yellow is, I think, between one and ten times the standard, and orange is greater than ten times the standard. And all these little, uh, I think this is purple, all these little buildings here represent uh, the homes of people who are involved in one of these toxic torts. And just by showing these five colors, you can tell a very good story. This entire neighborhood here seems to live around wells that are clean. This neighborhood doesn't. No contours necessary here, no statistics, just simple putting dots on a map and, and adding some judgment and some colors. Here we've added a time series. This is a bit, a bit old uh, and a bit, uh, a bit clunky here, but tells a good story. Here we have bars representing the concentration of contaminants. The bigger the bar, the higher the concentration, and we start at year one and go to year 10 here. Blue is non-detect. These wells are off-site. This contaminant used to be non-detect, and then it was detected, and now it's detected at a very high concentration. Same thing here, very clear increase. From this, we can deduce that there is some sort of mechanism that is slowly bringing water from the dirty area into the formerly clean area. Uh, no interpolation here, still just data, but a lot of data, data from for different years. And we can get a lot fancier, and we certainly do in a courtroom situation. We have to remember that our world is three-dimensional, and, and a 2D map is often not enough to tell the story. I'm not a big fan of these kind of oblique views, especially on a computer screen or, or a piece of paper, because it, it's kind of hard to tell where they're supposed to be standing, and um, you don't really know if this orange blob is, is close to you or far from you, but, um, but they do look cool, and they, they, they can uh, tell us something. So what happens when we leave the plan view? Um, I don't like the oblique views, but I sure do like cross-sections. I like looking at something from head on, and I'll show you why. This is a three-dimensional interpolation of Again, chemicals and groundwater. These are army barracks. So let's say I live in this barrack right here. This map tells a terrible story. It looks like the, the great tube sock of death here has blown downstream and is right into my basement. But if we rotate this down, so we're looking at a cross-sectional view. This is that same sock here. This is that same lobe. Here's my barrack. There's still stuff in my basement, but it's way deeper than my basement might go. It's still a problem, but it, but it definitely tells a very different story. There's also some geologic influence here that's forcing this contamination down rather than up into my basement. So that, that cross-section, that the third dimension is absolutely imperative. We can do a lot in three dimensions, but we always have to defend ourselves. We have to understand how much judgment there is. So what we often do is not just 
show a three-dimensional view, but also color code it by the degree of confidence we have in that interpolation. So this is very important here. This is a, a geological layer that is thick in some places and thin in other places. And we, we don't want it to be thin because um, then we're going to contaminate the uh, underlying aquifer with our, our industrial facility here. So we have a bunch of borehole logs. We know the thickness of this unit. We've interpolated it. However, you can see there's some blue spots here that represent where we are confident in the value. This is the bottom of that layer. There's lots of green. And green here it says that we don't really know what's there. This is our best guess, but we're not very confident in that result. This is a way of communicating not just our result, but our confidence, our defensibility. One from there. This is an example of a slice through a three-dimensional interpolation. So we don't need to force the user to uh, think about three dimensions at once, but we can still communicate the subsurface. We can communicate the concept of what that third dimension is telling us, see what this represents in, in different dimensions here. Running out of time, so I'm going to skip through conceptual side model development and move on to the fourth dimension. Sometimes it's not even enough to tell our story in three dimensions, especially if we're making some prediction or showing some change over time. We need to include that element of time. And in a legal situation, we often do that through movies. We, uh, you've seen one of these already, but I'll show you some more. This is a series of interpolated boreholes where we've made an analysis of evidence of DNAP, so evidence of the non-aqueous phase contamination. And we're showing in the context of geology. And here we're turning on just one geological layer, one by one. It's obviously an interactive thing that we're, we're dialing around, but um, we recorded this as an exhibit for use in court. Oh, I'm getting a message that you're, you're not seeing uh, what I'm seeing in the animation, so I'll skip that there. But the point is we've taken a simulation and we've turn into a little movie that can be uh, transferred as a digital file, well, you're familiar with digital movies, of course, to show not just the three dimensions that we've analyzed, but uh, to show the um, time series as well. All right, I mentioned at the beginning that conceptual graphics kind of live outside of the life cycle of data, but, but they do have their place, especially a, a true artist rendering of something that has a scientific concept. So this is an example of a plume here. There's no plume in, in, in history that is this smooth. Um, obviously, this is something that's been rendered kind of by an artist, but this shows where we believe this plume is with respect to a geological layer and, and cross-sections, et cetera. Here's another. This is another movie that, that probably won't play, but it's um, one of these uh, three-dimensional, well, four-dimensional in this case, images that are much nicer than what we could actually get by interpreting true data, but do tell a story. But beware, you know, it's, uh, since this is just an artist's rendering, it's very difficult to defend if, in court. If you're simply telling a story, then, then this is sufficient. If you're trying to say that this represents what's truly happening based on data, then you may find that very difficult, as you know. But sometimes even the four-dimensional movie is not enough, and the best way to understand your site is to virtually walk around in it. And um, uh, something I, I, I do frequently for my clients is serve their data back to them in a web-based or a desktop-based application. And I find that this is particularly useful for lawyers, attorneys, so they know that their experts are not producing some PDF of a map that tells a, a story that's contrary to what you want them to tell, but rather will give you the data and, and let you draw your own conclusions. It's not enough for your expert to give you a picture of their data. If you spent a lot of money and effort collecting the data, then you really should have it all. You should have a tool that lets you interact with it and, and, uh, and explore it on your own or with your other experts or, or with other uh, colleagues, etc. I'm not a fan of your data being held hostage, as it were, by, by a consultant who will only give it to you in, in charts and, and graphics that they devise. Sorry, I didn't realize this would need to reload, but 
uh, we're pretty much at the end of our life cycle. We've collected a bottle of something. We've turned it into data in the lab. We've determined we can use those data through data validation and database verification. We've assembled the data in a database, paying, paying special attention to spatial, geographical data. We have analyzed the data through some statistics, and we now understand the stories that the data are telling. And we've told the story through charts, graphs, maps, interactive presentations, movies, uh, three-dimensional oblique views, and that kind of thing. So we now can, uh, can truly comprehend everything. And the takeaway of going through all these tools and going through all these life cycles is all about completeness and context. How does the story change once we look at it through all these tools and visualizations, once we look at it in completeness? If we just look at, for example, plaintiff's homes, if we've got uh, somebody challenging an industrial client, uh, if you show the, all their homes on a map and you show that, that, that the industrial facility is in the middle of that map, it probably tells the story that everybody's been exposed. But as you add on additional data, chemical time trends, groundwater flow, uh, indo era chemical data in this particular example, our story changes very much. And we need to go through all these rigorous steps and go through them with, with quality in order to get to the point where we can tell this story in the proper context, where it can really make sense. Questions you might ask your expert on data presentation, uh, very similar to analysis. Are the exhibits complete? Did they only use a subset of the data? Did we use any assumptions that that doesn't make sense? Are, are our charts being honest, or are they hiding something, or are maps uh, showing low concentrations under high concentrations or over them in the drawing, and, you know, that kind, of a, that kind of difficulty. And as you expect, can we document every map, every chart, by its sample ID going all the way back to that bottle of stuff? Do we know where every single point came from, in which case we can truly defend it and, uh, and truly tell a story that, that uh, is beyond question? So in conclusion, we've got all these life cycle stages. We need to be aware of each one of them and understand the, the traps and errors that, that are inherent and, and very common in each of these stages. And finally, your access to data should not be limited to experts. If, if it is truly your data, then, um, then you should have access to this type of tool that lets you tell your own story.